Namaste. So, um, handed a little bit of an interesting topic. What do you mean, I'm not the body? We have entered, I mean, it's always been bad. But unfortunately, we're not really becoming more enlightened. People like to think they are. But unless a person is able to unlock this door, which leads you into a world of spiritual discovery and understanding, then one must remain bound in that which is temporary, that which is impermanent, that which cannot deliver what it is that we truly seek. On one hand, it's like a really simple idea. Anybody can sort of grasp, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to actually deeply appreciate and to experience the reality that the temporary material covering my body and my mind, these do not really define who I am. Not, not even a little bit. They have actually <laughs> nothing to do with, with my true identity. And until that time comes, when a person begins to seriously contemplate on and consider this truth of their actual identity, one must be faced with the reality that they will struggle through a life where there will be difficulty finding true and great value and meaning and which comes to an undesirable end. This is called death. But it's not a necessity that we live in this misunderstanding. So I thought I, I would share with you today a little um, <clears throat> few minutes. It's only about five minutes long. It's a um, portion of a um, short documentary some friends of mine in, in Europe are uh, producing. Um, they're going to be producing a series but what was, I think, really um, appealing for most people is they do some of these um, people in the street interviews. So they're in London and they're talking to different people in the street and asking them a few questions. And when you watch, the first thing you realize is, oh my God, that could be me. <laughs> you know, I, I'm no different than the people being interviewed. And you will see that many of the immediate responses that people give to certain questions are responses that we would most likely also give in the same situation. But when they are pressed a little to think about their answer a little bit more deeply, all of a sudden everybody goes into the state of it's not confusion, it is a state of this realization that actually I don't know the answer to these questions. Things that I thought were so self-evident, I realize now that I, I actually don't know the answer to them. And so we'll, we'll, we'll um, play this and um, then I'll, I'll just discuss it a little bit and hopefully um, you will enjoy and, and benefit it 
from it. Doing a research study on identity, and we just have one question. Yeah. Um, can you please tell me, who are you? My name is Christy. I am an American student. I'm from Colorado. My name is Zoe. I'm from Cyprus. Kathleen. Amy. <laughs> Troyes from Spain. My name is Mark. Natalie. Who am I? Well, my name is Gemma. That's who I am. I'm a um, successful, handsome French guy. I'm 82 years of age, but I'm, I feel I'm 18. All right. What else do you want to know? I want to know more than just your name. My job, where no, I live. I want to know um, your essence, who you are in essence. My essence. Yes. Happy person. I'm a happy girl. I, someone who's trying to go through life as happy as they can. A sassy, fun kind of guy who just likes to have fun and yeah. I, I see myself as quite unique, different. I'm quite energetic. Your core essence. Who are you? Not so much take away the traits, the, the culture, the family, the boyfriend, where you live, who, you know, where you're from. Take all that away and tell me, who are you? To be honest, sometimes I, I don't even know who I am. That's a really hard question. Who am I? Oh. Yes. Uh, I've no idea. You have no idea? No idea whatsoever. I don't know myself. So you don't know? No, I don't, don't know. know. Mm. I'm uh, a bit lost. A very small piece of the universe. That's, that's what I am. My essence is a person in the midst of a very fast technological world that is gone crazy and lost all sight of the real, of the self. Your core, your core being, who are you? <sighs> I've, I've no idea. Actually, that, that, that's a tough one. Uh, well, I have no idea what to say. The essence of myself. Yes. I don't know. I wasn't prepared for such a deep question. Yes. I never I really think of myself too much in that way. I get on with it. Um, what is my essence? I don't know how to answer you. I really don't know. I've never considered it. I think that's a difficult question. Yeah, it is. Does anyone have a ready answer? <laughs> Um, I don't know, no. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know, no. I don't think you ever really know who you are. I think you just go through life as a journey to find out who you are, but you never really know who you are. Now I realise I don't know who I am. Really, yeah. who I am, yeah. This is a good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> but what do you mean, like, who, who am I? Yes, who are you in essence? In essence? Yeah. Oh, no, that's hard. That's a little bit philosophical for me, to be honest. I've never thought of it like that. Who am I? To be honest, I don't know. Your core. That's Who are such you? a difficult question. It is. It's a very difficult question. Yes, In essence. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's really complicated. I mean, if you asked me all this stuff when I had a drink, I'd probably answer it better. I don't know if I can say any more about it. I mean, you kind of caught me out on that one. <laughs> it's really hard. It is. It's really hard to know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting to be asked such questions so you will have an idea and think about it. Yeah. yeah. If I were to ask you to point to yourself, where are you? Where is yourself? Your head. Your brain? You're your head. We, in Spain, we, we call it coco, the, the cerebro, the, uh, the brain. Point to yourself, your essence. Where is yourself? Myself. Where is myself? Yes. Wherever my head is, generally, that's kind of, I don't know, you know, that's where I am as yeah. such. Your head, like, your head here. Yeah. Okay. If my head is saying I'm something and I'm there and then I don't have to literally be there, but I am there in my head, you know, like, I mean, like a state of mind as such, maybe. State of mind, okay. Point to my finger would be here. <laughs> your mind? My mind. My mind. Where I am. So now I'm confused because I don't know who I am. How I gonna know where I am? Point with your finger. Where yeah. would that be? Yeah. your eyes? Yeah, yeah. If you're your eyes, oh, then I am my and you eyes. lose your eyes, yeah. then, then I suppose you'd think, wouldn't you? But you'd still be there. But it might. I might feel like I'm alone. <laughs> but you do get a feeling of like something inside. Yeah. A lot of people think they know how perception takes place. Take visual perception, for example. They imagine that it's very straightforward, that light comes from objects, it enters our eyes, 
It goes down the visual pathways and tickles up the occipital cortex at the back of the head. And that's the sum total of vision, apart from other bits of the brain being tickled up as well. The trouble with that causal chain of events, it explains how the light gets in, but doesn't explain then how there is a gaze that looks out. Well, some people indeed not only think that personality and consciousness is produced by the brain, they think it's identical with brain activity. But there are many reasons for questioning that. So I think we've got to think again about the relationship between ourselves, our brains and our bodies. And we won't even start that process of rethinking until we set aside ideas that suggest that we already know the answer, that we already know that we are our brains or we are our bodies. What do you think? It's a lot of questions, yeah? Especially when you're able to observe somebody that's very much like our self responding to these questions about who, who I really am. It, it's really an important question and you can see that people try to play it out in so many different ways. Of course, the most absurdly ridiculous way that it happens is through selfies. The idea that this snapshot in time of my body really represents who I am. And I try to put on this image you know, we, we, we struggle with this idea of identity. It has become such a big thing, identity politics. When they call people are divided into different types of groupings based on bodies, based on desires, based on political or social philosophies. And I really get immersed in that identity in the hope that I will truly find happiness, that I will truly find the things that are of great value and that which I seek. For me, you know, the first time I saw that, a few things jumped out. Of course, the East German guy or Polish guy, maybe he was, I think Polish guy, you know, saying, I don't even know who I am, so how would I know where, where I am, you know? <laughs> and uh, the woman, you know, thinking, associating her identity, her, who she is, with her ability to see. And the girl asking, well, what if your eyes were removed, if you were blinded? Then she suddenly thinks, well, what's going to happen? Yeah, you'd feel really lonely and you'd have this sense of, actually being there somewhere deep inside. And you can see how there are these sort of ideas that people have that we, we grasp at, but which do not really provide the answers that are necessary for us to come to live a successful life. In the Vedas, your success in life was determined by the degree to which you had a spiritual awakening. It wasn't equated with how much money you had or what kind of social standing you had or the size of your family or how beautiful or handsome your husband or wife was and bank balances. These things didn't define success. They were things that sort of you did, you know, during this journey in this particular lifetime. But real success lay in whether I was able to actually open that door and step from the realm of temporary material existence, which is not fulfilling and which can't give us everything we need, whether I'm able to unlock that door, open it and step through and experience a deeper and more meaningful reality. The process of, of meditation was 
precisely to help with this awakening. I mean, we, we take so many things for granted. Like, you see everybody in the street, they're like you know, I said, you and I. Everybody's sort of going about their thing and somebody comes up and pokes a microphone and starts talking to them and she seems kind of pleasant, so okay, I'll answer the questions. And I start answering the questions and then all of a sudden I'm confronted with this problem that I, I actually haven't thought this stuff through. I have adopted ideas that are not profound at all, that are actually completely wrong. And I am now dedicating all my energy in my life to living out something that is fundamentally untrue. This is the root cause, the root cause for all unhappiness. This is the root cause for all pain and suffering, the root cause for um, a general lack of, of fulfillment. There's this guy, um, a German guy, what's his name? Gunther von Hagen, I think it is something like that, Hagen's. And, and he, he developed this um, <laughs> amazing technique of being able to take human bodies, or any kind of body, and he puts it in this solution, in this, uh, you know, vacuum chamber and everything, and they plasticize all the tissue. And then when he's got this plasticized body, he starts peeling away like the skin and things to reveal muscle and tissue. And they, I think they recently, some months back in Auckland, had their, their exhibit here. And it's kind of like, it's really astonishing. Mostly people were utterly creeped out to go to anything like this. It was like, you know, <laughs> it's like hanging out on a morgue or something, you know, really. Oh, this is, what are you doing that for? And so he discovered that he had to start putting these cadavers into different postures. You know, and he's got one with a woman, you know, doing flexing muscles in this gymnastics pose. And then they had a photograph of a woman in a bikini right beside this thing, you know, doing the same thing. And you look at the difference between the, the cadaver that's put into that form and skin has been stripped away and the, the woman right beside it. And, and the, the contrast is so stark, is so stark. There was one that really struck me of a, a young um, girl with a parent holding the parent's hand and they'd brought the girl obviously to exhibit and in the exhibit <laughs> there was a stripped away adult you know, skeletal structure with some muscle and sinew, and then a small child where it was just a skeleton, and the, it was holding the, the adult's hand, like walking along. And the kid was standing there holding the, the parent's hand, looking at it in complete amazement. I mean, utter amazement. Because we don't really actually think about things very deeply. We don't think about, you know, the, the fact that our body is simply a machine which we are occupying and, and using. And yet, this is like such an important discovery. This discovery of my spiritual existence first and then my actual spiritual identity is what will utterly change everyone's life. And it is not a path of difficulty, it is not a path of great austerity necessarily or anything. It is actually a joyful path, a path of great happiness, where a person becomes awakened to their actual spiritual identity. And I begin to live in that reality, even while occupying this temporary body. 
And in this state, in this condition, gradually one is able to experience becoming free from all forms of fear and anxiety. One can actually attain great peacefulness. But the true fruit comes when a person is able to awaken that great spiritual love that we actually seek and to reconnect with the Supreme Soul in the highest uh, union that is to be experienced in this path of yoga. So we have such short time um, that we're not going to speak about things in any depth at all. But I was hoping that, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. But when you watch that, you know, it's sort of like, whoa, it's, it's a serious eye-opener. And then you have somebody that is actually a, a scientific mind who is declaring that the brain and the body are not really the self. Um, in another part of the documentary, he talks about the fact that every single atom, every single cell in your body, the matter within the cell, at least, everything becomes changed within three years. The lining of your stomach, I think it's only a couple of weeks, it, it's getting renewed. Everything is getting constantly renewed and replaced. Yet there is some consistency there if your identity was the body, then you would assume a new identity every few years. But the reality is you remain that same constant principle who experiences a young baby's body, a childhood body, a youthful body, a middle-aged body, an old-aged body, and you will experience leaving that body. You are that constant principle. And it is so important to live a life of balance, not just being utterly absorbed in that which is external, that which is temporary, that which is passing. We need also to cultivate the spiritual understanding. We need to, just as we need nutrition for the body, we need nutrition for the soul. This is what the spiritual awakening is all about. And of course, as we always mention, this process of meditation upon the spiritual sound is the most recommended and the most doable of all spiritual processes. And at the same time, the most potent of all spiritual processes that one can engage in during this time. Okay? Any question? Excuse me, if you were asked that question, how would you answer? How would I answer? Yes, just like that. Um, depends who I'm talking to. <laughs> I'm an eternal spiritual being, an eternal servant of the Lord. That is how I would answer. Of course, there's much more to add to that, but it depends on the individual. I'm an eternal spiritual being having a temporary material experience. If I get lost in that experience, like that it becomes my whole world, then I am gravely misfortunate. I'm really unfortunate to be totally lost in that which is temporary. When I become reconnected with my eternality, then I am most fortunate. Okay? So, um, Let's chant a little. They took the guitar away. Thank you. 
And does anybody else have a question? This is actually a really big subject, but hopefully it's just like a little bit of a reminder. Yeah. Just, I guess the question that she, she asked was, where are you in this form? Where are you in this form? Okay, thank you very much for that question. I will answer that. And I will answer that with a wonderful verse from the uh, Mundaka Upanishad. And it describes the Atma or the Self is atomic in size, meaning extremely small, and can be perceived by perfect intelligence. So part of this process of meditation is to purify the intelligence so one is able to see with more clarity. This atomic Atma is floating in the five kinds of air or prana and is situated within the region of the heart or the heart and spreads its influence all over the body of the embodied living entities. When the Atma is purified from the contamination of the five kinds of material air, its spiritual influence is exhibited so this is part of what the yoga process is all about, is to reconnect with our true and eternal spiritual being. And as one becomes increasingly purified and their intelligence becomes more and more purified, one will be able to um, actually see their own spiritual self and to perceive the spiritual existence within all life. Life is a symptom of the presence of an Atma, a spiritual being. Life never arises from matter. It cannot. No combination of material elements can produce life. Life is a symptom of the presence of another form of energy the Atma, the Jiva Atma. He is called the Tathasta Shakti. There is actually a very detailed science on this. And as one develops this spiritual vision, they are able to see the actual spiritual being within the bodies of all those living beings that you can see Okay.